Being a mom is the toughest job there is, and it doesn't come with instructions. So it's okay if you don't have all the answers. We'll figure it out together. This is Mom Brain with Ilaria Baldwin and Daphne Oz. My name is Dr. Alexandra Sachs. I'm a reproductive psychiatrist and host of the Motherhood Sessions podcast on Gimlet Media and co-author of the book, What No One Tells You, A Guide to Your Emotions from Pregnancy to Motherhood. And um, I, I am so excited to share with everyone this podcast and this book. I think the podcast is real women's stories. They're, they're so brave. They've volunteered to put it out there to help other people know they're lot, not alone. And the book is a, is a guide. It's the first guide to what to expect emotionally when you're expecting in a new motherhood. Mm -hmm. So it's about your heart and mind, not, not about the body or the baby. It's about you. I think it all stems back to how people learn to connect with other people. Yeah. And a lot of people think the way to connect them is to wow them. Like, I'm going to come in and I'm going to be, like, amazing. Yeah. And to be quite honest, that just either intimidates or makes people hate you or makes you feel unrelatable. Yeah. One of the things that I've tried, because as soon as I met my husband and sort of stepped into this world, people started trying to, like, shine me up and polish me up in ways that I was like, whoa, what are you doing? You know, I used to say, what do you think? I eat, like, golden cereal flakes for breakfast. Like, I'm the same person I was, I was a couple months ago right. before I was dating him. Right. And so I think that's one of the reasons where it has really become my mission to be so open is because the way that I, and I hope my friends feel this way, the way that I make people feel comfortable and make them like me yeah. is I'm just open and honest and I'm self-deprecating and hey if you're going through something I'm gonna unbutton my pants too do you know what I mean like <laughs> well, I'm that's, that's be, what made like, when you yeah. said that that's what made me think of it and I think you're in like social media is such an amazing thing because it's aspirational right and it gives us these beautiful moments that are a great break and that we all want to look up to but it's also an opportunity, I think, to be real, especially when when you do, like you guys, have people looking up to you and being mm -hmm. like, oh, their lives must be so perfect, you know? And so I think it's such an amazing thing when you speak about the hard stuff. But then it's interesting as well. So yes, yes, you want to speak about the hard stuff. But then you have the people who get, I feel, and it'll be interesting if this is like a thing, get to be almost addicted to being like the Here's what victim, I struggled with today. Oh, that's their Here is my main, crying yeah. and here is this and like right. everything with the kids is negative and right. everything it's with this is negative. It's almost as annoying as people who put up the, the, the picture. The no, the picture of themselves looking absolutely perfect. Right. Everything's great. But the caption's like, I just cleaned up. But it's just, you know, it's just, I, I was yeah. I was listening to what you just said though, Laurie, and I think, I think, um, a lot of it comes back to your intention. It's not yeah. that people don't want you to sparkle. It's not that people don't want you to be great and dynamic and exciting and interesting because a lot of the reason that, you know, that you're able to do the things in your life that any of us are able to do are because of your greatest qualities. Yeah. But I think the I think what you were pointing out before Alex is it Alexandra? Allie? Yeah, Allie. sure. A with Dr. Sachs. <laughs> Dr. What, what Sachs. You? Dr. Sachs. I think what you were hinting at before is the belief that if you share about what what makes you vulnerable, it damages what makes you strong yeah. is, is, I think, really where women get at odds with each other. I mean, yeah. your friend will try to share with you something that they're struggling with or your yeah. friend will try to you know, relate to you on something. And I've had women be like, oh, really? I never had that. And I know. I freaking know that they did. Yeah. Yeah. And it just drives you batty because... You're the, because I think that's I think that's the intention there is to make you feel less than. But, I think that's really when you run into and you button, button yeah. heads. I hadn't heard this mommy wars thing, and I think it's really interesting. Yeah, um, but I guess like where do we as women think that that comes from? Because you know, I guess as a therapist, my first thought is insecurity. You know, mm -hmm. I think there are so few things we understand so little about things like why we miscarry. What, why this month we get pregnant and not the month before, mm -hmm. why one child has a more difficult temperament than the other. We understand so little about it. There's so little that's prescriptive about how to be a good parent. Like it, it's, it, there, there aren't these right answers. So I think it's very scary when things are happening to you your, and your children that are out of your control that you don't know why. And I think that's one reason I've thought of why women are like, no, this is the right way to do it to each other in that kind of competitive way. Because mm. they're trying to reassure themselves like, OK, I'm doing it right. I'm doing mm. it right. But beyond that, like, why would one woman want to make another person feel lesser than? But I don't think it's just with women. I think that that comes down to human nature. I mean, everybody 
is that that it goes back to people wanting to build them push other people down to build themselves back up again and i just think it's a i mean some of it might be a bit of a personality thing but the personality thing is based on what they learned when they were young yeah and you know i feel like i came from a place where everything was kind of have hippie parents everything was about community and yeah. working together and you know i um growing up i i had some some catholic and i had some quaker uh -huh. completely different yeah and like the quaker thing is that everybody must agree on things that my whole family was about you know let's bring everybody together i mean i had spent a lot of my childhood in spain everything is like open doors come in let me give you a hug let right. me feed you that right. kind of thing right. of course you know all these places have competitive natures as well and you know all the things right. but i think that Ultimately, it comes down to: Do you feel? Do you feel okay when other people feel okay? I feel great if I can make you happy. Yeah, I'm gonna be happy. Yeah. If you, I said something to my husband this morning. I was like, I'm not even gonna get into it, but it was like so silly. And he said it to me, it was like such a nice moment in a way, but like made me feel terrible. He said that. <laughs> he said that really hurt my feelings. And what I'm saying it's a nice moment because like Alec doesn't talk like that and I try to teach him to talk like that. Like, yeah, it's my good kids communication. Talk, like, really, I know, he said that really hurt my feelings and I almost started crying because like the worst thing you can say to me is that I hurt your feelings. Mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. I've, ever since I was younger, like I remember all the times and it's like, it's like you're stabbing me. Like I'm like, yeah. oh my God, I'm so sorry. But, and I almost started crying. Oh, but that's a thing. really interesting moment because bring it back to like two women your friend could say like, "Oh, I'm I'm so excited. I'm I just found out I'm having a girl." Da da da. And then the other person maybe has gone through a miscarriage, and they could say that really hurt my feelings, not because the other person's doing anything wrong, but because it's their stuff. And so sometimes, like when someone's informing you, they're basically just like, "Ouch! You just pushed a button that you don't know about." So I'm I'm telling you that hurt my feelings because of my stuff I mean right, maybe but, th but th maybe that's what say that no no, no yeah. I definitely I definitely said something that I yeah. that I mean I could I, meh, eh, it wasn't that bad yeah but it yeah. was like I was so proud of him for being so open oh yeah I was like but I'm like I'm so sorry and he like, we got over it in like 30 seconds like you want to make people thing. feel good I want to make people feel good but just the, the idea that I said something with like such intentions that would hurt his feelings right. and I was just like oh my god but let's get back to Daphne and me Okay. <laughs> Let's I'm, talk I'm about no, this. I, I you got husband training is a very interesting uh, di dynamic and, and topic to discuss, and we we will go back to we it will go back I think to there's it. a lot. There. Yeah. But let's go back to because us. I yeah. think you you guys are a model for women who look up to you, and and for two friends, right, who are going through their own motherhood mm -hmm. journeys about how to share and support each other when you're in a different moment. Just like snapshot today, right? You guys are in two different moments, so. So interesting. So Daphne is pregnant with her fourth child. I have four children, but just had a miscarriage. Daphne has one boy and three girls. I have one girl and three boys. Interesting. I very much want to have another daughter. Yeah. So let's and take... And I very much would like to have another son. Exactly. So, exactly. Uh -huh. <laughs> that, that being said, yeah. I'm not like when Daphne like tells me that it's a girl, I'm not like, Oh. Yeah, no, I never I, felt no. that. Like, I'm no, not even but you, a little but bit. But I could see that that would be something. And interesting, this time around, when I'm, when I'm, because since I had such a public miscarriage, which means, you know, that so many people have access to tell your feelings, their, yeah. them, you, their feelings, which I think is really actually interesting because you get to understand people's humanity. Yes. What, how do people really, what do what they want to say? Do they want to share their story? Do they want to make it about you? Do they want to, and what makes know, them feel better? Get nervous? Do they, they get feel better knowing that you went through something similar to them? Do they feel better knowing? Most people. Yeah. yeah. And, and knowing that, that they're allowed to acknowledge that, that, that it happened to them, that they yeah. felt a certain way, that they're, that they're valid. To your point, you know, if you, if you tell your friend your feelings hurt, because they're because they're going or they're experiencing something that you longed for and you're yeah. not having in that specific moment. Yeah. It doesn't make it shouldn't make their experience any less special. It's not that you're not happy for them. Right. It's just la allowing them into your inner emotions of like, oh, if I didn't respond to that in the excited, jubilant way that I want to as your friend, I right. want to be like, this is amazing. I'm so excited. Right. But for me personally, just it hit this raw open wound. I actually think if we were able to have that level of like deeply vulnerable and honest conversation we would all be in a better place i agree but it feels you're nervous you're gonna like hurt your friends feeling that you're not happy for, i mean this yeah. whole you know um well i was surprised this time around how many people 
who were pregnant apologized to me that's for being interesting pregnant and that's kind that's of where I wanted at. to get yeah. exactly huh. that's where yeah. I, I wanted to get with we're this whole there. thing yeah. and I was yeah. like I know it takes us a minute sometimes we like we like take some like pit stops along the way but um you're thinking but but you know what at that and, and I said to myself don't ever apologize for being happy and doing I mean I I've, I've also done it and even if I hope I would feel the same if I didn't have kids obviously that is a different you know life and I I don't know it but you know I mean I understand that this thing that just happened to me has happened to almost all of my girlfriends yeah almost all of my girlfriends and it's once you open your heart up to be to having kids you got to open up the possibility that you're going to get your heart broken a few times. Yeah. Even, you know, whether it's a miscarriage or it's your kid doing the thing that you don't want them to do yeah. or, you know, getting to uh, hooking up later with the wrong person. You know, I mean, all these different ways yeah. that I see, you know, the next, you know, 50 years yeah. or whatever it is. It's scary. But, yeah. uh, but you know, personally for me, because I think I'm somebody who wants to make feel people feel comfortable and wants to to show my true colors, especially because I think I'm somebody who's judged a lot. Yeah, um, I'm sure you know, Daphne as well is judged. Everybody is judged. We just have a lot of more eyes mm-hmm, judging mm-hmm, us than mm-hmm. the average person. Um, and so you, I'm constantly trying to be like, no, this is me. No, this is me. Like, you guys are wrong. I'm actually, like, a really nice person. Somebody came up to me at a party the other day, and she's like, thank you so much, and started the whole thing about sharing yeah. miscarriage, and that she had a miscarriage. She said, it really changed my opinion about you. And I was like, <laughs> And, and yeah. I was sort of smiling. and said, oh, well, I'm, I'm glad. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for like, thank not you. thinking I'm a bitch <laughs> exactly. anymore. Right. Yes, I know. But so when people have to realize as well, like if you're somebody, if you're listening to this and you're somebody who's out there, I strongly believe that when people say that, it doesn't offend me because it just says so much about that person right. and their journey right. and they're being open and, right. you know, as well, they're being unfiltered. That sounds unfiltered. Right. And maybe they'll you know? change Maybe they'll change their behavior the next time. They won't because be so quick exactly. to assume something about 100%. someone else. Yeah, I yeah. do. I mean, I do. Look, I think... I think part of why we've been loving the conversations we're able to have on Mom Brain and had the response that we've had is because it just goes to show that you can you can think someone's life is so easy from the outside looking right. in. You can assume you you referenced a couple of things that women oftentimes think they're the only ones in their friend group that they struggle with, and right. everyone else who they're friends with is perfect. And the you know breastfeeding, fertility to begin with, partnerships, all of these things. And I actually think when you know the, the sort of conversations that we have that are first and foremost about motherhood, but really dynamically about women, period. Yes. About what it means to be a woman today yes. in this modern environment where there's so many inputs coming at you all the time and so many judging eyeballs. Whether, I mean, Ilari and I are, live in a public world where where it's a different scale of eyeballs, but I feel like everyone has some degree of exposure mm-hmm. that like my and mother one. and my grandmother and yes. my great-grandmother were never exposed mm-hmm. to. Or it was different. Um, like, I think we're in a beautiful time for women because there's so many more roles that we're, we are, are acceptable for us. Like, working, being financially powerful, but then there's still the traditional roles that women still want to occupy, being domestic, being caretakers. And I think it's I think women like in the 50s were judged in certain ways like oh you think you, I just watched the opposite of sex um, the Ruth Bader Ginsburg movie yes. Oh, yes. It and it's it's beautiful because it shows her as like in that era that she was turned away from one after another law firm and it was just like why aren't you home taking care of your children she was like I'm the number one person in my class in law school right. <laughs> Are you but I mean that was a different time they were judged for those things I think in this time we're judged in a much more confusing way because it's like there are so many different right ways to be a woman but right. I think there's no way to do everything <laughs> perfectly and so I think that's that thing that maybe women bring to each other like okay I'm supposed to be beautiful and this weight and successful and nurturing and patient and supportive of my friends even when I'm on, on like how, you know how do you do it well on top so going on that people will often say on social media to us or to other people um okay well you know they have this and this and this but they have people helping them or but you know 
this and this and this or but she doesn't do this very well or but her husband's unhappy right. like there's a lot right. of like okay well, what how, let me look at this what and are let you me sacrificing figure, let me that's figure letting it out. all of the right. other things be good somebody wrote to me I, I don't know last night or the night before or something like that it was at night I remember because I was tired when I was reading <laughs> um, asking like how do you do it all which you hear that a lot I, yeah. don't, I don't know how you do it all you know fitness and work and kids and husband and red carpets and all I don't know how you do it all and my response was, I don't. Right. I, I don't do it all. No one does. No one does it all. And I make mistakes and I get overwhelmed. I had a lot of kids at my house yesterday and I really like was on to like pull my hair out of the end of like just like having to, you know, handle everybody's different meltdowns and emotions and stuff like that. And and it was fun. Like we had a lot of fun, but I needed like a minute afterwards. Yeah. And, you know, it, that was like a perfect example of I, I didn't do it all. And, you know, Romeo was throwing things all over the floor and I'm like on my hands and knees, like wiping it up and then walking walking away and then realizing I missed a spot and I have to like take out the cleaning products again and do it. I mean, there's there's just these days where we just, or every day, we don't do it all. Right, and so much of life is mm-hmm. out of our control. Like when your child is throwing things on the rug and making stains, it's, it's not like you could prevent it necessarily. No, you can't. And, I mean, you, and you shouldn't, and you should allow them to not do that necessarily, but allow them to be, you know, he's 11 months old. Like, what am I supposed yeah. to do? Like, but I oh, also, you should know I that? I think there's something more at play here, too, which is, like, we we have a really hard time determining what it is that makes us happy. Yes. And I think we look around us and we say, oh, well, this makes her happy. Like, maybe I'll try that. Or, yes. like, I'll try this because this seems to work. And I, I think if we are honest with ourselves about what we actually enjoy and mm-hmm. what really brings our lives a lot of meaning and makes our families happy, makes us happy, we don't have the same need to do it all because that's that's just like first of all only only women think that we really have to be all the things that you just said there are 24 hours in the day inevitably things fall by the wayside if you worked out today it means you probably didn't answer all the emails or if you answered all the emails you probably didn't get to do pickup or if you did pick up you probably didn't get to go to the gym like right. there are trade offs they right. have to exist that right. way um and and i think we are really hard on ourselves we we assume any degree of help is like sacrificing our motherhood in some way you know if your friend does you a favor it's like oh well i should have been able to do it myself and it's no you shouldn't have it's insane why would you bother like if you if someone's offering to give you a hand let them and and then return the favor and i love i think that community is so critical but i also think us taking ownership in our own lives of not feeling the need to justify everything that we do to make it okay for everyone else. Yeah. There are sacrifices I make all the time that I would never expect any other mother to make. And there are choices I make all the times that lots of mothers don't make for their own families. And it, like that's because that makes me happy and it makes our family work and it makes our family happy. And I think um, I think we're afraid to, to, to be, maybe it sounds selfish, maybe it sounds like- No, I think, you know. I think what you just said is extremely wise. I think that what you're just, you said if you know what makes you happy, this is not so difficult for you, this issue of looking around at others and comparing yourself. And I think it's that's really the work, is trying to look within and trying to find a way to feel grounded and accepting of who you are and your journey, like where you've been, how you got here, and where you want to go. That's what you want to look out in the world and look for and become excited by and push for. And, you know, not not other people's journeys, right? And and it's like I think you should also want to have other people's journeys be happy because the more happy people there are in the world, the better we are going to be. I want to walk down the street and I want everyone to be be happy. I don't want to be like, okay, everybody can be happy, but not as happy as me. So I'm just going to. No, yeah. just, no. just a notch. Or, just or, a it's, notch. or it's like, like <laughs> Daphne no. said, it's like a warning sign. Maybe I'm not in such a good place today if I'm struggling noticing someone else's joy. Like, what do I need to do to right. take care of myself right. better today? Because clearly my cup is not full. Mm-hmm. Right. You know? And and I think that's that's really that's really important is being able to sit with that feeling because that feeling feels like crap. When, yeah. you're, when you're when you realize that you're that that someone someone else's happiness, joy, experience, whatever feels like it's a zero sum game for you. Feels yeah. like somehow it's off limits to you because they're experiencing it. I, I I don't I I feel like it's really hard to sit with that and feel like it's not about them at all. It has nothing to do with right. them. It's about how I feel in this particular moment. But 
I, I found this to be really helpful, whether it was with, with, you know, starting at the very, you know, early part of my life with weight loss, starting with school, going into, you know, new new marriage, going into motherhood in the beginning, especially, um, where I, I would frequently try to remind myself of processes that I'd done successfully before, things that had gone well before, and the steps it took to get there. I want you to describe for, for everyone um, what it is to say, to say you're in reproductive psychiatry yeah, I think sure. it's a really exciting novel term people won't have heard about and I, it's yeah. really important to get to that phrase but I but I want to talk about the, the 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 shedding of the skin of like who you were before you had children yes and allowing yourself the process to be successful in that and realizing as you will from all the other times you've been successful in your life that it's never easy the whole way right and it's never perfect the whole way and no one ever does it all the whole way right. people have backpedaling and then they have periods of growth and then they have plateau and then they I mean it's just yeah and that's what makes it. life so exciting and interesting is that we're constantly evolving yes it would be so boring if we hit that you know stepward wife and never <laughs> no, nothing ever changed no hair out of place nothing no. ever changed yeah so I'm a reproductive psychologist psychiatrist that means that I'm a medical doctor and I'm trained as a psychiatrist and then I went into this specialty training that's really around treating and preventing postpartum depression and depression and anxiety during pregnancy and breastfeeding which they needed a specialty for to answer basic questions like is Prozac safe to, to stay on now that I'm pregnant right. mm. or if I have postpartum depression and I'm being started on antidepressant what do I do if I'm breastfeeding so it's a very technical medical subspecialty that is um, with you know people who are amazing who who mentored me who really call the literature and try to answer these complicated questions that are really about risk and benefit and treating and preventing postpartum depression or what we call now the P mads perinatal mood and anxiety disorders my work has sort of taken a little bit of a right turn from that work because as I was going through these conversations with women, I was realizing that people were using this term. People were saying, do I have the postpartum or do I have postpartum depression? And, you know, I, these were people, whether they knew it or not, it was like the word they had heard of to describe right. struggling. And for so many of these women, they did not meet clinical criteria for medicine mental illness for a depressive disorder. That n Not to say there's anything wrong with that. We need more research and advocacy and treatment for depression. But there were a, a whole large group of women who were going through a developmental transition, who were struggling. And it, for me as a physician, it was not a surprise because your body's changing, your hormones are changing. All of your relationships and roles are shifting, not only like the amount of time in a day that you have once a baby arises to take care of yourself or to be with your friends or to How be with your partner. How tired you are. The fatigue. Exactly. Those are all of the behavioral and biologic things. Yeah. How your sleeping changes, how your body changes, how your sex life changes. I mean, it's so physical. It's so hormonal. And it's so psychological just in terms of when this creature comes, you know, newborn human babies we have this creature. They're so <laughs> like creatures. They're, they're, little they're, creatures. They're, they're little aliens. In, I the, know. in the animal kingdom, they're so. They would never survive. They would never. They, we. Um, someone explained this to me. I thought. Sorry to interrupt you. No, but no, it was you, so you know it. No, no. It's, it just was. Someone explained that when humans became bipedal, we had to walk on our two hind feet. Our pelvises had to shrink to allow that to happen. That's right. And they're too small to birth babies at like a theoretically properly gestated That's right. age. So they come. All of our babies come premature. I mean, there's no other animal that births a baby that is as completely unself-sufficient as That's human right. babies they're, are. No, no. You're. That's you're interesting. You're crazy. <laughs> You're totally on it. Um, th there's that, the size of our pelvis, and also just the metabolic demands of an infant as, you know, a baby that would be 10 months, 18 months. Chimpanzees are, when they're born, their babies are the way our babies are at 18 months. Oh, my yeah. gosh. So, so the caloric demands, what we would need to eat in order to feed these creatures, we, we couldn't do it. So it's the size of the pelvis and the metabolic demands that are, like, put us out of the Crazy. running. So we have our babies, what is it, like, m like many, many, many months before they're, quote, fully cooked. That's why we talk about the fourth trimester because right. it's, it's actually it's the first trimester of motherhood. 
and I think the language should change to talk about that. Like, it's not your fourth trimester, it's your first trimester. Right. But it's the baby's fourth trimester because the baby's still growing. The baby kind of, mm. you know, they're sleeping, they're not really interactive. They're kind of as if they're still in utero because yes. they're not really ready. So what's required in our lives, the cognitive attention and the emotional attention, and I think the natural, like, evolutionarily inspired uh, anxiety, vigilance mm-hmm. that's required to zero in on this vulnerable creature, everything needs to shift to make room, at least in the beginning. So this change for a woman is physical, is hormonal, it's psychological, it's cognitive, it's an intense demand. And, and then the, the literal body that you're in is changing and the sleep that you're able to have is changing. And the supports that you're able to get by nurturing your other primary bonds of intimacy with your partner are changing. So it's it's a developmental shift. And there's this word, it's, it's really hard to remember, so I'm not sure it's so helpful to keep using, but it's called matrescence. And it was coined by a medical anthropologist in the 70s. But it's a word that I like because it sounds like adolescence. Because we know that teenagers are all over the place in body, in hormone, and in their social roles. That's interesting. And so we don't, when we see teenagers struggling, we're not like, do they have a depression? No, some teenagers some do, has. right? It's, it's not that we need to take that seriously. But to not feel like you naturally know what you're doing, to not feel like you have your bliss, to not feel like you have everything under control, we do not expect teenagers under those right. similar circumstances to have that. It's an awkward phase. And so the same is, I think, true for new motherhood. I mean, I think, I think what you're saying as well can be related to almost any time in life. I mean, you look at our toddlers yeah, and we, I mean, my, some of my best parenting moments are when I can really, really, really have calm and understand that they have no like full frontal formed frontal lobe, as yeah. I would call. It. Yeah. Like they just like they just still like, exactly. Yeah. And so when I can teach them, expect them to be better. When I can have the hope and the idea that say, okay, well, you know what? We can't hit. We don't hit. You're teaching. I them. understand that they do hit. But then yeah, they, you're you helping them hit. grow. Exactly. So I'm guiding them in the right direction, but accepting that what they're doing is that. And the same thing when we just have the baby. So, I mean, when I, for I ourselves. have for ourselves, when I just have a baby, I am like I have my highs, my lows, my fears, even with four. You know, I'm still like when they're sleeping, I'm like, like nudging them. I'm like, are you still breathing? still breathing um and you know i mean yeah i mean you have the night sweats you have you know the the um your body is all of a sudden like just shrinking shrinking the amount of blood loss that you have or growing i feel like mine didn't shrink for a while yeah (laughs) but no but i do i think you're so right i think it's it is physical it is emotional but i also think it's if you're someone who entered motherhood or entered pregnancy with your life really, you know, under control. And like you knew who yeah. you were, and yeah. you knew how to interact with people, you knew what to expect from their interactions with you. Yeah. You kind of you could count on yourself. I think that's really what shifts is yeah. all of a sudden you're like, Where I I know I had a train of thought. Like I know it was there, it was on the tracks, and now it is completely gone. You you have to get to know yourself in a new way too, and how all of your most deeply held conceptions of who you are and yes. how you function in the universe have completely changed overnight. Yes. And I think that's scary for people. And they don't know that that's natural and normal. I think people worry, does this mean I'm not cut out for this? Does this mean that I don't have those nurturing instincts? Does this mean that I'm selfish? No. It means that you're going through an extraordinary shift and you've never done this before. And change is hard. Change is hard, even if it's the most beautiful change. You know, that's why people cry at weddings. It's just, <laughs> it's bittersweet. It's new beginnings always involve an ending. And like motherhood is one of the most beautiful and exquisitely scary new beginnings, mm-hmm. you know? What, um, how can people tell the difference? So, so we understand right now we're on our journey and we understand that there is postpartum depression and then there is new motherhood. What was the word yeah. you used? Matrescence. Matrescence. <laughs> then there's matrescence. How can we, so somebody just has a baby, they're listening to this, or they had a baby a while ago and they're wondering, or they're going to have a baby and they want to know what to look for. How can you tell when it is true postpartum? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think what I always say is when in doubt, ask your doctor or call the postpartum support international hotline, which I can give you guys to share. Okay. Basically, when in doubt, if you need medical help, just ask. 
Because worst thing that'll happen is that someone will tell you, you know, you're going through an adjustment period. There's there's this you should be feeling better after a few nights of sleep. Right. But then if you're in that zone where you'd really benefit from treatment, great. Then you're on your way to getting the support you need. So I would never encourage anyone to self-diagnose. That being said, I think there are some cardinal things like sleep. If you're unable to sleep when you're tired mm-hmm. because your mind is racing with worries, that's that's an issue, right? That's an issue where you're not able to like let your body rest, right? right. Or if you're unable to eat. Or if you're unable to experience any pleasure, like mm-hmm. let's say you're watching your favorite TV show and, you know, the baby's finally resting. And if if nothing sparks joy anymore, those are symptoms of depression, mm-hmm. right? I think crying is complicated because in the baby blues, which up to at least 80 percent of women have, you can have that emotional sensitivity. I cried a lot. A lot yeah, of crying a lot, for yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. A lot a lot of yeah but, it, but, 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 you know, if you're feeling hopeless and if that's your and if it's really hard to escape that emotion, you know, those are all symptoms. But oftentimes anxiety is the primary thing. So you mentioned before checking and observing your baby. Are they sleeping? So things like that, again, natural kind of vigilance, that's totally natural. But if you have, let's say you call your pediatrician and they say, nope, everything's fine, (laughs) nothing to worry about. Or sometimes this happens with feeding, like, you know, am I getting my baby enough milk or, you know, are they rolling over yet? Are they meeting their developmental milestones? If after asking reassurance from your pediatrician, if you still don't believe it, if like day after day you just cannot trust right. and and kind of give yourself a moment of peace when your child is in fact safe that that may be a sign that anxiety is taking over and so with with treatment you would actually be able to think more clearly and not not doubt your own logic so much with my with Carmen I so the entire pregnancy I mean it's my my first baby I had all the the milestones and I'd be like okay if I can just get to 3 months okay if I can just get to you know 16 weeks Okay, you know, the anatomy scan. Okay, we get to this part. Okay, if I can just birth her. And then and then I thought it was like clear coasting. It's going to be great. I remember her on my chest right after she's born. And I was like, oh, my God, I have to keep her alive now. I haven't been planning yeah. at all yeah. for this. Yeah. I was so focused. So the first week, I did not sleep moments at a time. Like literally, like my family came over. Like already, They're like, go into your room. I had this thing that's like a some sort of like camera that I could do from my phone. Fortunately, Alec broke it very soon after. <laughs> it was like, but it, but I could. You were move looking it, at it when, and you I could, could have watch been her. Sleeping, so, yeah. No, I went into yeah. my room and I'd be like, zzz, and they're like, hey, Larry, we can hear the cameras. <laughs> yeah, but I was so afraid because all of a sudden everybody told me about SIDS. Yeah, and I was like, oh my god, my baby, I'm I'm gonna see my baby and she's perfect. And then she's just going to die. Yeah. And that's it. Well, I mean, it's like that combination of that awareness of their extraordinary fragility and how do you live with that reality. But you know what? That's true for toddlers. That's true for teenagers. Like, how do you live with the reality that you can't ever 1,000% fully protect your child? That's a human. That's like the human nature of parenthood. But then then also know that you're doing the best you can and also be able to live with that. But that's true for being like a human being. How do we know that, you know, we're not going to walk across the street and da, da, da. But this matrescence that you're talking about, I mean, I feel like the first few months of Carmen's life, it helped me to learn to let go. It gave me the skills to be able to wrap my mind around this miscarriage that I just had Yeah, of realizing, you know, you put these babies out there and you can only do your best to try to protect them. Yeah. And then the and then you're just gonna have to, you know, take deep breaths and heal again and again and again. Yeah. If even for the tiny, tiny, tiny things. Yeah. And you I know, think but, that's where perfectionism comes in too, because I think that's another thing that people judge themselves about. Like the breastfeeding thing, you know, I should be this, I should be that. It's not always in your control. It's often not in your control. And so that's why we have this other expression, which is good enough mothering. 
And I think sometimes people say, oh, my baby deserves better than good enough. But I'm sorry, you are a human being and perfection is not an option for you. You're not a robot. It doesn't you don't stop growing and evolving. You're human. So you're constantly balancing your needs, the baby's needs. Your body will sometimes give you what you want and it sometimes will frustrate you. Mm -hmm. So this thing about perfection is kind of like even in this universe, we're as if we could control everything and as if we could give our child as if if you stood over that crib and just never slept that, that was that, my plan it, you know but but you can because you have a brain and your brain right. won't function if you don't sleep and I think just honoring that and like the system is designed for that we are supposed to be human because if we were perfect then our children would have that example that they would have to be perfect and that's not good for self-esteem and if we were always needing to be in our children's hovering, you know, that's what fosters the helicopter mothering or the snowplow parenting, you know, it interferes with a child's development when you're always in their face and not giving them any breathing room to make their own mistakes because that's how you learn, right? What I've done, because we talked about helicopter parenting Mm -hmm. recently, and so I'm trying to be like super aware now of it. And so I'll pick my, I I have my thing where I pick my battles. I'm like, okay, I'm going to be a helicopter parent when they're eating because choking freaks me out. And and my kids, a couple of them have not like horrible choking, but just like enough to make my, I choked when I was younger. So I'm like traumatized from choking, like really bad choking. It was horrible. Um, And so I've got terrible fear of them choking. That is scary. And so, so scary. And then they just, sometimes they just cough and I'm like, oh my God. (laughs) <laughs> it's the moment I'm like slapping on them on the back and forth things. But then I'm like, for me, I'm I'm such a monkey that my kids love to climb up on things too because they see me do it. And people will come over they're like, whoa, whoa, they, they shouldn't be doing that. And I'll ask them like, are you good with what you're doing? What are you thinking? And then so I like, I'm like, all right, I freak out with the, the eating. But you're going to be great. You can be climbing up on something. Be that's great. a great example where you you that's a human revelation, right? You're more anxious about some things than others. You you know intellectually that your child knows how to swallow, right? Like right. Yeah. just as they know how to jump properly, like their bodies are developing their sense in space and those natural reflex. But for you, because of your own history, the swallowing thing is more scary. Mm-hmm. So you're allowing yourself to kind of let those fears. I chop off everything. Really, you know those puffs that. That um that disintegrate in the mouth, no, dissolve yeah, in the mouth. Puffs. Yeah, I cut I cut those puffs up into twelve, <laughs> pe- 12 pieces you when they got first started. To be kidding nope. Me. Now, but now Romeo, <laughs> this is the fourth child. At like ten months, I started giving him. He's gonna grab the bottle half from pieces. you. Like, Give me that. <laughs> exactly. Give now me at eleven months, thing. he gets the whole thing, which is like way more advanced than any of my other kids. That is so no, but we all have our things. Yes, we all thing. have things that make us anxious. That's called being human. And it's great to give yourself, to let yourself relax when you can, and to accept that you're going to worry about things, too. Mm-hmm. So let's go back to when you when you meet with patients. Are you primarily meeting with people who are new mothers or mothers a few years out or yeah. expected mothers? So there's a with? whole range. I'm going to tell you guys about the women I'm meeting with for my podcast because based on HIPAA, that's like those are the people who volunteered okay, to share sure, their stories. Sure, sure, sure. And, and it is very reflective of the women that I meet with in my office. Um, and I've worked with in hospitals and all over the, the 10 years that I've been doing this. I think there are lots of different things that women struggle with. So just for example, on the podcast, we have a woman who's coming in. She's in her late 30s. She lost her a parent in her early 30s. And that really set her off course, right? Like we talked about your journey. That was kind of what she was focusing on, parenting her siblings, right? Working on trying to help her family with financial stability. So she's in her late 30s. She's dating. She's doing great. But she's like, I want to have kids. But I don't know if I am ready to do this by myself. How do I navigate my biological clock? She had fibroids, so she's learning about egg freezing. So, like, that's a motherhood story, right? She's on her way, but that's where she is now. She doesn't know. She, she, that's that's a struggle that she wanted to have help with to think to think through. And how did you help her reason through that? Well, you know, we talked about all sorts of things, but I think helping her figure out her mother was a single mom and she really admired her mother she like she 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 they were very close and she looked up to her as like a hero like a superwoman but she herself actually really wants to be partnered before having a baby mm-hmm. 
She really does. Mm-hmm. And I think I think a lot of these stories, it's about talking about where we've come from. Like you so beautifully just shared that you had a choking experience as a child. Like so many of the things that are our hangups in parenthood or in our planning of our lives have to do with where we've come from. So for this woman, you know, she was kind of like felt like it was a weakness that she couldn't just say, I want I want to be a parent. I'm going to go for it. She was like, no, I actually want love first. And I'm going to figure out the next steps, however it works with adoption or wh- whatever right. is my path, you know, but that's that is what's important, most important to me. And she had to kind of like give herself permission to say that she actually didn't feel ready to be a single mom. Um, so that so kind of like like allowing yourself to be on your own journey. Another woman um, who I spoke with, uh, who was the the episode last week, was about to deliver her second baby, and she was feeling really tearful about ending this time with her first. Oh, that's so hard. That is that is really. I feel like there's. I've never met someone who doesn't feel that way. Yeah. Yeah. It's it was so it's so interesting. And I spoke with someone yesterday about this as well. It's like this feeling of loss. Mm-hmm. And again, that goes back to the bittersweet. It's not just about new parenthood where every new beginning also involves an ending. It's also like with a new addition to your family. Right. That's a change. But for her, again, this had a lot to do with her family story. She had had some traumatic separations in her family. There was a divorce. And so for her, change was associated with bad. Mm -hmm. But we talked about how might change be actually for the better. Your daughter is no longer a baby and she's now a two-year-old and about to become a big sister, but maybe that's what she wants. Maybe she's excited about growing and and running around and feeding. Exactly. Maybe she doesn't want to be a baby anymore. You know, maybe change comes with good. That's, that's it. That has what helped me so much. I mean, Carmen, I don't know how you felt about your first, the first birthday of Philo, but I cried. I was like, but she's not a baby anymore. That took me 18. That she's going to leave my house. Like all of a sudden we went from one to 18 and then gone. And um, and then she started getting like really excited about her birthdays. And she was like, I'm such a big girl. And then you kind of like get excited with yeah. them of like, oh, yeah, you're great. Like, of course, you have your moments. You're like, oh, my baby. But there's some like element of it of growing up is really beautiful. And yes. you can start to see that. And then that's that moment. I mean, I every single time I have four kids. I don't know how you feel as well. You have, I have two things they have to respond to, Daphne. <laughs> okay. So the so the other thing is every single. I feel exactly the same way that she that she was feeling or is yeah. feeling. Yeah. Same time, I have a kid. Yeah. And I get like weepy with my youngest at yeah. that point, and because I'm like, oh, it's not my baby anymore. They're always your baby. Right. They're always your baby. And the fact that you're even thinking about that means that you're going to be a really good inclusive mom who is going to bring them all together. Yeah. I think I, w- I wonder sometimes, like, I'll walk into the room and and all three of them will be there in the playroom playing together. And I find my I catch myself having this, it's sort of like an out-of-body cognitive experience of, like, who do I go to first? Does it affect the baby if I hug the older two first because they're closer to me or they're running at me or they're a, I know they know and they're waiting for me to come to them? Or is it about her because she's the littlest one and she's had the least time with me so far and like, do I, you know, should I go to her? For, and I, 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 in listening to you have this conversation, I realize that's because I feel like I had, my, and my siblings know oldest. this, yeah. so I'm not like bursting anyone's bubbles, but I had this blissful, you know, four, almost five years of being an only child. Yeah. <laughs> and then my sister came along, who I'm now best friends with, and I love my siblings dearly, but it was a really rough first couple of years. I yeah. mean, first couple of years of feeling like, how could you do this yeah. to me? Yeah. Life was so good. And and a part of it was because I was treated like a little adult, and I, my mom was basically a child when she had me, and mm. you know, I, my dad was in medical school, and we would we would have these long stretches of time where he wasn't coming home, because back then, doctors did not have you know right. like any kind of regulations about how many hours they could work, so he'd right. be there for you know 100 hours on end. It was crazy. So we'd pack him in the car. We'd go to my grandparents' farm. I was it was just so much intensity of love and nurturing all focused on me and then yeah. I feel like once my siblings started arriving obviously that had to be shared my mom got busier but it was also my the re- expectations on me were changed right the responsibility I had were changed totally was changed and I think I resented that feeling of like my innocence was lost my ability to be just a normal like just a kid was lost and I had to be a big sister and right. I had to help and I had to be aware and I had to be more grown up I had to be more mature and so when I catch myself um 
with Philomena, particularly my oldest, like I, you're, I, when you said that you were crying on her first birthday, I remember fe- our friends had left, and I and I you know, I was put, I put her to sleep, and I I actually remember crying almost like every night after I put her to sleep because I would sing these songs that I remember. I'm gonna cry now. This is like hormones are so <laughs> fucking crazy, guys. <laughs> so real. Um, but they I just, they were songs that like I that my mom would sing to me when, when I was little and like. And I was I just remember feeling how precious that time was and how fleeting yeah. it was. I'm really not gonna cry. Um, I, I bring ther- I bring, I bring tissues with me wherever I go. It comes with the t- it comes with the territory. Yeah, right? um, but I but I feel like that's what I'm most hyper aware of yes. is allowing her to have the moments where she's still gonna be a kid. Like she just turned yes. five and five was five sounds like and feels like by comparison to the babies a big age it's right but, but it's kids, still very little they're just little and and when they have these you know she she is especially by comparison to me i was this horrible little tyrant philomena is this like wonderfully nurturing she loves to be a big sister she loves to include her as her brother especially their best friends and she I, wants to make everybody feel she good make, she, she is you she she's like, hilarious she she's wants to make everybody like literally and, and it's funny because when my daughter who's the same way yeah, and her thanks, daughter Kyle. get together thanks. they had this one i feel like they've only had like one incident ever one and they were like in the moment. It was like it was I don't even so understand. What was there's something about a unicorn? There yeah, it was, was like it was those like bouncy, bouncy unicorn, unicorn things. And then both of them ended up crying because they thought they hurt the other one's yes. feelings. Right. And it was like oh, right. we sweet. Were just like, <laughs> it was really sweet. sweet. I was completely sweet. confused. But a couple <laughs> things. Like, it was so cute. First of all, it's so great that you have the insight that your experience of being an only kid for a little while and then the shift is coloring how you're looking at your kids. So yeah. I think that's like the number one thing that I try to work on with people is what is your story and how is that impacting your gaze as a mother, right? Because Mm. we've all been through this before because we've all had families except we were the kid. Mm. So you're bringing your own stuff and I think the best way you can truly see your child and, and parent them with the most empathy is to just be aware of your own story and how it's coloring what you're seeing. But but your story is also so great because this was a moment of frustration that you experienced as a little girl. You were like, I miss the attention. I don't like this responsibility. But I guarantee you all of that frustration that you experienced gave you extraordinary strengths that you have now and that you brought in with you once you were school age, you could tolerate like being around other children. Oh being no, around other I'm the people. mother hen for all my friends. I I have I am always the big sister. I'm oh in my mentality, and that's what to your point about the two year old whose brother making her a big sister and her allowing her to grow up as actually maybe what she wants and maybe what she needs. That's how it ended up. It ended up coloring the personality I have now. A that for the most part I'm I'm pretty good at like going with the flow and being part of a group and yeah. and 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 seeing what other people need without them having to ask for it because mm-hmm. the people who Empathy. needed things from me were little and didn't know how yeah. to ask what they needed yeah. for um but it was also yeah it it is it, it that's something that I think is really just to put a a bow on this conversation about the challenges of motherhood yes. because they feel so dire when you're in them and they feel interminable and you're like well I ever feel good about myself again will I ever feel capable of this and competent to be a good mother will I ever feel like the mother I thought I was going to be yes and I think what you end up feeling is so much better than that actually because you you are you are the perfect mother for your children yes your children are the perfect children for you and you're learning from each other the whole time yes Mm -hmm. that blew my mind and it's a flow and that's filled with flaws if you had no flaws if you were a machine you would not be the perfect mother for your children Mm -hmm. they want you with your flaws because that's like you know what did I hear someone describe someone was like describing how their child they they had gained weight but their child was like oh those are like the cuddly parts like they were just just like more of you to love but, mommy but 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 <laughs> but whatever it is like like the moment where you you do burst into tears or you do crack up or whatever it's like that's where they see your humanness that's where they see your humanity and that's where they learn by example about their own feelings and yeah. so you don't have to be perfect that's that's not the point and and also just like these moments where our children experience frustration are not bad for them that that's healthy and you're going to use your awareness to see with your with your five year old like you know she still needs her baby time so you'll carve out moments for her where it's just still one-on-one and you'll give her that you know it doesn't matter that she has other babies in the house we struggled 
we prevailed mm -hmm. and we became really wise in the process. So I think wise. that is the takeaway. So now one I know we have to let you go, but one thing before we let you go that I'd love to bring this bring this back with something you just said and then I just for for mothers and future mothers who are listening, um, I wanted to to ask you this about. Um, so it goes back to you are the perfect mother for your kid. Your kid is the perfect mother for you. And I think that that also helps going back to what we were talking about at the beginning about um, the rivalry and jealousness yes. and stuff yes. like that is, you know, I mean, I'm sitting next to a woman who is having another daughter yeah. and is pregnant. When we were pregnant, we were like, oh, we're pregnant at the same time. Yeah. Like we talked about due dates, how far and stuff like that. And not for a moment do, not only, when we already covered, not for a moment do I not want her to be happy and have her like amazingness um, and have a healthy baby and all the wonderful things it's going to be. But I also like, the idea that people would sit next to each other and want what the other person has. Yes. And it's like, well, I don't want her baby. I right. want my version. Right. right. Do you know what I mean? I hope that I'm I am I know I will be in that place. Right. But I'm but I'm and I'm gonna be excited and Daphne's gonna be excited for me when of that course. happens. Yeah. But like I think more women can get to say, Okay, this is your experience and I can't put your experience on my experience. That's such a, that's such a good point. You know when you're little and you're and you're jealous of your friend or someone gets to do something that you didn't get to do. Like all my mom, my parents were so such control freaks. Uh, we're not even they, I thought they were control freaks. They really just wanted us to have time as a family, and yeah. that was like their number one priority. So yeah. I never got to go to parties. I never got to go to like you know. I never got to go to like R-rated movies. I mean, they were it was crazy. That's why you're such a party animal yes. now. That's why I'm a rager. <laughs> um, but that's but but exactly. I was like, well, why why you know why does she get to do this or why doesn't why does he get to do that? And my mom or, or and my dad, everyone would always say. You not just like well if you know Jimmy's jumping off the bridge are you gonna follow? Him? Yeah. But, oh my god. But, yes. But also. Would you trade places with them in right. a heartbeat? Would you mm -hmm. trade places with them? And the reality is, and part, and just to bring it full circle, part of why I think the conversation that you sparked, Larry, is so important, is because no one ever knows the details of someone else's life. Yes. Right. And the the little ways that we can provide color for people to see that there are so many so many struggles that are private and silent and and that you that you see some of the good stuff and you assume that that is everything um you would not trade lives with them even for all the great parts because it wouldn't be yours right. you know and that's that is i think something that we will always struggle with of course. <laughs> but, yeah. but, but the I more think, that we can acknowledge and focus yeah. on it i think that you can get to a place where like hey i'm me i'm enough I don't have to be perfect. And the more that I focus on myself, the better and better and better I'm going to be. Yeah. And the parts that you like the I best. I think just use your feelings as information. Your your gut, your feelings, even when those feelings are sadness, are information about what you need. So if you're looking at someone else's life and you're thinking, ooh, I'd like that, I want that, then maybe you need to think about how to get it in your life, your exactly. version of it. It's information. And, you know, we all, to sit with your vulnerability to sit with your truth is to tell you what you need to feel better and what you want next but it's it's not going to come in someone else's lane it's going to have to come in your people lane people will write to me and they'll be like oh my god I wish that I was with your husband and I'm like I'll give him to you for about 24 hours you'll send him back in 7 I promise you <laughs> you're going to have tried all the things you'll be coming back in 7 <laughs> but it's that idea of you look at somebody's life and you're like mm. but it's but like mm. to that point it's so funny What what is it about that experience we really do have to let you go, but just no, just no, this no, last no, point. No. What is it about that experience that they're that like if you, if you're the person feeling that way, is what you're craving stability? Is it someone to see you? Is it nurturing? Is it partnership? Is it more adventure? More adventure, right? like whatever you know, whatever yeah. the hell it might be. Is yeah. it sushi on a Thursday night? Yeah. Like you, you have to again. You have to be responsible for and okay with. To your point about the patient who knew that she wanted a partner before she had children, which many people don't care about and she really cared about and that she had to know that was what was yeah in her mind what she needed to be happy. And I think that's what's really cool is if you – maybe something makes you feel icky. Maybe something makes you feel less than. Harness that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Use that to let you know about yourself, something that you feel you're missing that you need. And if you can fix it, fix it. Mm -hmm. And if you can't fix it – release it i think that's there's a there's a saying that i can't remember right now because i have so many holes in my brain um but but it's that you know 
give me the strength to to fix what I can and no, and it's 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 a saying. I think there there is a saying in AA that's so beautiful. Yes, um, the courage. I, I'm not going to get it right, but it is something to do with like the the courage to face the things that that I can change and the acceptance to to, to accept the things that I can and sort of the strength to know the difference. I'm, yes, I, I no, but, that was I very butchered that, that was too. Very good, but it's yeah, it's it's your feelings are information and your vulnerability can be your best clue about mm-hmm. what you need next. And I think like to wrap up all the things we talked about today, we're not static, we're not perfect, we're not robots, but that's the good news because we're constantly evolving and growing. Our children are, and that's why things get a little messy, but that's why you have to tell your truth, check in with yourself mm-hmm. and figure out what's next for you and figure out what your child is also trying to communicate to you about what's next for them. And our spouses and our friends. Yeah, it's all in a it's nutshell. Organic. You should be happy, and everyone around you too. Yes, yes. Well, <laughs> I, would say, I would say, I would say, in a nutshell, you should try to find the courage to face your truth and make space for everyone around that you too. too. Yeah, because it's not a happy okay, every not, day. Not be, ha- but you know, happy, be accepting, self, not be perfectly authentic. happy. Maybe but it's not that you have to be happy, but that you have to mostly feel happy. you. You are allowed to be happy yes. and that everyone else is allowed to be happy yes. and that we are all on a journey. No one is static. Yes. No one's perfectly exactly where they were always deciding to yeah. be. And sometimes the road to happiness involves some bumps. Oftentimes. And, and, but yes. you know what? I think that there's – whenever I feel unhappy – I always try to think like, oh, but it could have been so much worse. Or, oh, but like, like I'll drop a coffee. Beautiful, beautiful quality of her. She'll like spill a full coffee. And I'm like, and and then I have that moment of like, oh, and then I'm like, at least it's not white. We call that a coping skill. Exactly. No, immediately I do it 100%. That drives my husband crazy (laughs) because he's like, let me just be angry for a second. I'm like, but it could have been so much worse. It could have been cement. It was just it could have grape been on juice. Fire. Like, it could have, like, we have absolutely nothing in the world. Keeping perspective. <laughs>